the base model generally for canine aggression normally has three parts, but recently we've added a fourth to it. And basically you've got predatory, which is what we'll discuss mostly tonight, defensive, and we'll go through what that is, dominant hierarchical, which is actually very small, but it still needs to be there. And then we get into non-classical, which just means that basically we don't have a definition for it. That um, there's things that we've seen in them that don't fit the classic models that exist, and I'll go into those as we go forward. The reason why we're going to go through all of them, even though with greyhounds you're really going to deal with two mainly, is because all these things exist in every breed of dog. It might, it's nice to think that they, they're not in one breed and they're in another. That's not true. It, it can't exist in one and not in all. Um, based on the way the gene pools have formed and evolution has formed with the dogs, things that exist in one exist in all. It's rarer in some than others and, and so on, but all these behaviours exist in every breed of dog. So that's why we're just going to run through them, cover two more deeply and two that are just sort of going to be touched on quite quickly. But in the end, to understand aggression, you do need to understand all facets of it. So the first one we'll go through is predatory, and you'll hear the terms of prey drive, keen, keenness, these sort of words to describe it. In the end, prey drive for me is no longer a term we use. Drive theory was a, a theory that existed for a very short period of time in behavioural models throughout all psychology, and then the rest of the psychological world moved away from it and dogs stayed with it for some reason. But in real terms, it breaks down when you look at drive theory that it would mean that a dog would need to have a, a drive to defecate and a drive to urinate and a drive to vomit, and it breaks down when you go into it like that. And that's why the rest of the behavioural world moved away from it and why we now use the term predatory or predation. That when we're talking about a dog that's doing these behaviours, we're talking about it being a predation dog, okay, that we do this. Now, with prey drive and predatory behaviours, these are used for in nearly every form of um, dogs that are working in the world, from your greyhounds through to police dogs, military, like I was saying, but even herding dogs, hunting dogs, pointing dogs, any dog that's basically got desire to go and do a task is doing so through predation. So it's very common to use it. It's just that we've moved it in some dogs towards one facet and to another they use another way, but it's actually still the same brain mechanism that even a dog chasing a ball is in predation when it's doing it. That the same brain mechanism is occurring when it's chasing a ball. It might be a lower level. It can be every bit as high, but it might be a lower level on a ball to, say, a rabbit. But at the end of the day, it's exactly the same brain mechanism that is occurring in all of it. So the whole point of predation is to chase and kill. That's the behaviour that we've taken from the wolf, if you like, and we've manipulated and bastardised, for lack of a better word, to shape behaviour towards a certain point, that it is the desire to chase and kill. That's what predation is, it's what it's for. It's the whole idea of everything that exists in it. Well, then we just manipulate it, control it. The dog is then restricted on certain things that it does, but at the end of the day, that is the whole point of predation. So literally, just another point on that, it's food acquisition. That's really what it was used for at the start of time, if you like, that if you believe that wolves, uh, the, the domestic dogs come from wolves, that that's what they've done, that it's basically a food acquisition behaviour. Now, this is where we start to get into it a little bit more. It is a cold behaviour in terms of that there's no emotional attachment to the dog for doing it. So the fact that it kills a rabbit, it doesn't feel bad about doing that. It enjoys it, it, it likes it. The way to think of it is a cat killing a mouse that it's a cold kill. It just goes and it does it and it's moved on. Okay? That's the nature of predation, is that it's a very cold behaviour, that in the brain mechanism and what's occurring, the dog is very much aroused and enjoying it and we go into these things as we go further, but it's cold. The dog has no emotional attachment to what it's doing or what it's done. It just goes and does it, and that's the way it works with predation. It's very much a non-emotive behaviour. It's just done, moved on, and we're on to the next thing. And like I said, it's the, the best way that I can equate it is like a cat killing a mouse. No one thinks the cat has some attachment. No one's concerned that it's actually a problem and goes on further. They just go, oh yeah, the cat killed the mouse. And that's what happens. And it's very much the same as what's happening with predation, um, whether it be hunting or whatever. Those dogs are doing it. They're cold about it. They do it. They move on. They enjoy it and they're aroused by it and they want to do it again but they're cold about it. They're not emotive. They're not concerned or stressed, which we go into later when we talk about defensive. So enjoyable and active. The dog must enjoy being in predation for it to occur. A dog won't do it if it actually goes, I don't want to do this. The very nature of that behaviour is that the dog really enjoys it and enjoys it deeply. As soon as they don't enjoy it, they stop. With predation, as soon as it becomes not enjoyable anymore, they stop doing it. The best way that I got this equated to me when I first started training dogs was 
If you're out on Christmas Day and the kids have got a new footy and you're out and you're kicking the footy, you're having a great time about it. But then you go and eat a full meal and you sit down and you're like, oh, geez, you know, I don't want to... They go, let's go kick the footy again. You're like, no, because it's no longer enjoyable. And that's the way we look at predation. Whereas when we get into defence later, we'll talk about this, that if someone kicked in the front door then and tried to grab your kids, it doesn't matter that you've got a full stomach. You're going to do it anyway. You're going to come out and fight, if you like, no matter what. Whereas when we're talking about predation, as soon as it stops being fun, the dog will stop. And the reason why that's so important and why we make such a point about it is it's the biggest way that we can manipulate the dog to move away from being predatory in its behaviour. That it enjoys chasing a small dog, let's say, or whatever it is, and killing it and grabbing it and fighting it, but as soon as we make it not fun, the dog will stop. The dog will go, I don't want to do that anymore because it's no longer enjoyable to it. Okay? Every dog will chase a ball, but if it has to chase a ball through razor wire, it'll go, I don't want to chase the ball anymore. The value of the object is diminished based on what it takes to get it. Now, some dogs will run through anything to get a ball, a rabbit, whatever, and that's the depth of predation, the desire that it has. The higher the desire, the more the dog is willing to go through adverse effects to get it. However, at whatever point, every dog will go, this isn't enjoyable anymore and I don't want to do it. They won't continue. As soon as dogs tire, they stop doing it. They go, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to chase the ball. No dog will chase the ball indefinitely. They chase the ball until they're physically fatigued and then they give up. It's no longer enjoyable. So level of desire and strength it is performed at. That is exactly what we're talking about, about depth. And the way that I equate that is desire. The more the dog desires it, the more it will go through to get it. So when we're talking about, the, when we've used the term before, prey drive, what we're talking about in that is what desire does the dog have to do it? Because that's all drive really means. When people say, oh, that dog's got a lot of drive, what they're really saying is that dog has a lot of desire. It really wants to go after that dog, the cat, the bunny, whatever that may be, the ball, anything that it's doing with regards to this, its desire is very, very strong. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about those behaviours, that the dog's desire is very high. Okay, so it needs very low levels of success to be repeated. So what I mean by that is that when the dog has done it and enjoyed it, straight away it will want to do it at a higher level again. It will straight away go, wow, that was so good and I really enjoyed it they will then go to higher levels to go through it. So if they had to run through a pile of blackberries the first time, and they did, and they got out, and they were successful in getting the object, the next time they're willing to go through barbed wire because of the fact that the desire is higher, that it takes very low levels of success in predation for the dog to build on it. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of techniques that have been used and spoken about with regards to fixing a high predation dog don't work because of the fact that the dog needs very little reinforcement for it to then go, I want to do that again, and I want to do it again. When we're talking about this, and I'll discuss this in a minute, there's another point here that it's not a permanent behavioural change. That is very much the case with all this. You haven't actually taught the dog never ever do that again. It's actually just changed it to a point where if the dog then does it even at a small level again and no one teaches the dog that's incorrect, straight away it's reinforced to do it. It takes very low repetitions for the dog to learn this is a fantastic thing to do. Its desire, if it's genetically got that desire to do it, very soon it takes only one or two repetitions the dog goes, wow, we're off and we're running with this and it really enjoys it. The dog will put all its attention onto the object that it wants. It's got total and utter desire to go after that. So it blocks out everything behind it. It's very focused, it's very calm. It might be aroused and going, I wanna go, but it's calm in what it's doing. It's focused on getting the job done. Its whole emphasis is towards getting towards that object and taking care of it. Everything else is really in the peripherals. It might have to go through some adverse conditions to do it, but at the end of the day, it is very much focused on what it's doing. And when you'll see a dog in predation, you'll see them go quite rigid. Their focus will go straight onto the small object. As soon as they walk into that paddock, they see the dog and they just put every bit of focus onto those dogs to make them basically just think that's the best thing they've ever done and they're really targeting that animal. And that's what you'll see with predation, that the dog is very calm but aroused. It's very much like, oh, I want to do this, but it's calm and focused on the job at hand. Okay, so when we're talking about predation and then 
the whole idea of this is obviously to look at how do we rectify it. The best technique that I've seen is what we call crittering. And basically what it means is that we get the dog aroused at a very low level. So it's aware of it. We want to have some distance between us and the object. So once again, if it was a dog and there was a rabbit, we might want it way over the other side of the room there or even further, that it's aware of the object, but it's not like so close. It just goes, oh my God, that is fantastic. I want that. So we're just getting it. And then as soon as it's put its attention to that animal, we'll create an adverse effect on the dog. It can be pulling on the lead. It can be something else, but something that makes the dog uncomfortable. Because like I said, saying before, the dog must enjoy it. Otherwise, the dog will cease to do this predatory behaviour. So what we're trying to do is create a degree of aversion towards the object and no longer make chasing that animal fun. Now, like I said, there's a huge variety of techniques to do this with, and it depends on the desire of the dog as to how far you need to go. But at the end of the day, you need to make it think this is no longer enjoyable that you can do things by trying to get their attention elsewhere and focus them and, and do all these things. But at the end of the day, what you're doing there is masking behaviour. The only way that you can get the dog to start to seek not to chase is by making it think that it's no longer fun. That's the only way that I've seen that it consistently will get the dog to go, I don't want to do this. And so, like I was saying, you're working with the dog where it's aroused but not off of its head. Because once it gets to a really high level where it's just screaming and focused on that animal and, and just going to go, the level of aversion you need at that point is so high that it makes it very difficult. That you have to create some degree of discomfort on the dog that is so high that it goes, I don't really, I don't really want to do that to a dog. So, you're better off working where the dog is at low levels of arousal. It's well and truly aware of the object being there, but it starts to shift away from its desire to chase it. We use this a lot with um, sheepdogs that have killed a sheep. Okay, we start to teach them that they can't go into that level of desire. You'll see the difference between one that really wants to kill and one that wants to hurt. And as soon as we see the body language change in a dog that wants to go and kill a sheep, we just create that aversion to it again. So it takes it away. What we're trying to affect is the emotional response of the dog. We're trying to get it that when it focuses on that object and it feels good, now it feels bad. Now it goes, oh, there's something that I don't like. It's discomforted. I don't like the feeling of that. And we try to shape that consistently until the dog actually goes, well, there's that object. I don't want to do it. And it will go into some degree of avoidance with it. It'll take its attention away because it realises the object creates discomfort. And so by doing so, you start to shift behaviour to the point where it goes, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Now, like I was saying, even when we do that, this is not creating a permanent change of behaviour. This is not something that we've actually changed the genetics of the dog. The biggest influence on predation is genetics. You can manipulate it by creating success in doing it so that, once again, chasing a rabbit and getting it creates the idea that it's a good thing and it lifts. But the biggest influence upon that is genetics. Okay? Genetics dictate the, the amount of desire that is imprinted into the dog. You can encourage it or discourage it, but at the end of the day, you can't change the genetics. And it's the same with what we're talking about now with creating a version to it, that we you don't actually change the genetics. They still exist. All it is is the dog thinks the outcome is poor, so it shapes itself away. It doesn't want to do it anymore. But as soon as it does it once, so let's say we've done all this work and we've shaped the behaviour where it goes, I don't want to do that anymore. And then all of a sudden a little dog or something or a cat comes running out and runs right past the dog and it goes, whoa, what was that? And straight away it feels positive about it. It feels like, hey, that was a good thing. I, I got aroused here. I felt good. And nothing's there to say incorrect. No one's there to create discomfort onto the dog. The dog has had success again. And it will take very few of those repetitions for the dog to regress because its genetics are steering it that way. Its genetics are making it go, this is a great thing to do. And it will take very, very few. Like I said at the start, it takes very few or very low levels of success for it to become reinforced and the dog to repeat it. That is very much the case here, is that we can create a version to it, but if it goes back to being able to do it, it will shift the behaviour back to that very, very quickly. That it takes not a lot of repetitions for that to happen. So where that comes in, obviously, is in the end, we need to make sure the end user knows how to control that behaviour if we're going to house those type of dogs. Because without them, if they own the dog for 10 years from the point that it's adopted, if they don't stop the, the um, desire from being reinforced, straight away, the dog will regress extraordinarily quickly. It will take no time at all for the dog to go back to what is its genes that are telling it to do. And the genes are far more important than what we teach and reinforce.
at the end of the day, we must create the idea for the dog with predation that it's not a positive thing to do. I'm working with a, a dog at the moment where we're going out and, and seeking some little dogs and creating it. And the dog's desire would be uh, medium um, at best. It's certainly aroused when it sees a dog at the distance. The first dog we did it with was a little dachshund. It saw a little dachshund and it was quite excited. But just on a buckle collar, me just creating some discomfort onto the collar after we taught it to walk properly by getting it on a loose lead, it was pulling to start. We got it onto the loose lead and then I can add discomfort through the collar. It only took very few repetitions and it no longer wanted to chase a little dog. It just went, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. So it's a very soft, handless, soft dog, which makes it very easy to train. But by just creating the aversion, the dogs really switched off to the point where we took it for a walk on Saturday morning and it took a huge amount of arousal by some other dogs, like so the stimulus from these other dogs running back and forward for the dog to even trigger. And even then, it just took me moving back and just giving a few little tugs on the lead at a very low level for the dog to go, okay, yeah, I won't do that again. And so it's switching off. And then what we're gonna do now is bring it out to class and we'll put it around a dozen small little dogs and teach the same thing and keep reinforcing it. Now, like I said, there's no two ways about it. If that dog is allowed to regress, it will. It'll go back to doing that if they do it. Even with mediocre drive it or desires, it'll do that. But if they just keep reinforcing it, the dog will just stay in that frame of mind, that it needs to be reinforced. And that's no matter what behaviours you're looking to shape or train into a dog, they need to be reinforced. If you're working against the genetics of the animal, it, it, the genetics will override if they're allowed to.